Perceptions is brought to you by the Edgewood Church of Christ in Columbus, Georgia, as an effort to promote more Bible study and to urge people to live their lives according to its teaching. The British playwright Shakespeare said that a rose by any other name is still a rose. That has become a very familiar statement to all of us, and sometimes people use that with regard to the idea that names really do not matter. But do they? Do they really mean something to us? I think that they do. Names, for example, can be uh, identification for us. We have certain names that we respond to. And uh, they also not only identify us, but they are descriptive. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a statement that we all uh, perhaps, perhaps were familiar with since childhood days. But really, none of us like to be called names that are demeaning. So names are important. In Proverbs 22 and verse 1, Solomon said, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Keep that in mind as we look here in Acts chapter 11 beginning with verse 19, whenever the Apostle Peter has made his report to the church at Jerusalem regarding the conversion of Cornelius. Here's what the record says. They therefore that were scattered abroad upon the tribulation that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to none save only to Jews. Of course, we find that in the early history of the church, Basically, the brethren, the apostles, and others went to the Jews. They already believed in God. They had respect for the Word of God as contained in the old law, the law of Moses. And so now then we find that those that were scattered abroad, that as a result of the tribulation that uh, came about due to Stephen's execution and martyrdom, they began to speak the word in various places like Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to the Jews only. But it says that there were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number that believed turned unto the Lord. And the report concerning them came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas as far as Antioch, who, when he was come and had seen the grace of God, was glad. And he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. And he went forth to Tarsus to seek for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that even for a whole year they were gathered together, together with the church and taught much people, and that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You recall the spread of the gospel as we have recounted it in our study of the book of Acts. Indeed, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ was proclaimed all over the world. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, our Lord said to the apostles, that you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Beginning in Acts chapter 2, continuing through chapter 7 of the book of Acts, we find emphasis being given to the preaching of the word in the, in the city of Jerusalem and its environment in Judea. In chapter 8 of the book of Acts, we see where the, the gospel spread even unto the city of Samaria. And then also, in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, we find where the, the gospel came unto a proselyte, the Ethiopian eunuch, a man who lived in the country of Ethiopia, had traveled more than a thousand miles in his chariot to worship God according to the old law in the city of Jerusalem. He was a foreigner, but was a convert to Judaism. And the gospel was taken to this man. Then also, in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, for the first time, we read of the conversion 
of a man who was a Gentile by birth and was a Gentile by choice in his life. His name was Cornelius. He was a devout man. He feared God with all of his house. He gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And yet he needed to know what he should do in order to be saved from sin. And so in Acts chapter 10, uh, we find the conversion of Cornelius. And uh, now then, here in the latter part of the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, we see where the gospel has spread under the city of Antioch. Antioch of Syria. Here was a, a place where basically the city was filled with idolatry. The population of this particular city had no relationship with the Jewish faith, uh, that is, from the religious standpoint. And uh, so these people were composed basically of Romans and Greeks, people from various parts of the world. And men of Cyprus and Cyrene came to the city of Antioch, and they preached to the Greeks also. And when the brethren at Jerusalem heard about their reception of the gospel of Christ, they sent a representative by the name of Barnabas to come and to check up on these people. And he saw that indeed they were sincere in their response to the word of God, and he encouraged them to continue in God's grace. He sent to Tarsus for one by the name of Saul, whom we also later know as the Apostle Paul. We read of his conversion in chapter 9 of the book of Acts, and likewise he recounted it again in chapters 22 and 26 of the book of Acts. But he was in Tarsus at the time that Barnabas was in Antioch, and he went to Tarsus to seek for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And they continued their labors in the city of Antioch for a about a year, and uh, when they were gathered with the church, they taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Up to this point in time, Christianity had been viewed by a lot of people as being a sect within Judaism. They thought they were some branch of Judaism itself, much like the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were perhaps the legalistic uh, branch of Judaism, but also there were the Sadducees who did not believe in angels, they did not believe in the resurrection, and so forth. But there was another branch of Judaism known as the Herodians. These were a political group within Judaism who uh, believed uh, that they needed to support the political aspirations of the Herods. And then also there were the Essenes uh, and the Zealots. The Zealots also were a sect within Judaism, and they were a radical element within Judaism who believed that indeed uh, they needed to oppose the Roman government to the point of assassinating uh, Roman officials. And so a lot of people thought, well, that Christianity was a branch of Judaism. Jesus, by birth, was a Jew, and basically that was the emphasis of the preaching of the gospel uh, in, its, in the initial stages of the church. But now then, they were branching out, and uh, there were Greeks who were approached with the gospel, and they became obedient to the gospel, and this was in the city of Antioch. These people basically were not Jews necessarily alone. They had, didn't have any Jewish background. Uh, they did not observe the mosaic ceremonies and rituals and things of that nature. Basically, a lot of the folks in, in Antioch were heathens and pagans and Greek idolaters. But they were called Christians now because they had obeyed the gospel of Christ. The word Christian comes from a reference to Christ. Uh, the Greek word Christos is referring to the Christ himself. Ionos is a word that means a slave. 
in a household. And thus you have Christians, those who are enslaved to Jesus Christ. The source of this name is not found among the enemies of the Lord. They were not the ones who gave this name to the Christians. Neither did the disciples give the name to describe themselves. There were other words used in the Bible uh, by the disciples to describe themselves. For example, we find several instances where they're referred to as brethren, uh, referring to their relationship to one another. Uh, they were brethren. They had a kinship in the Lord, and thus spiritually uh, they were brothers in Christ. But also the word saints sometimes is used to describe those who were followers of the Lord. The word saint was not a word that was reserved for people who had already died and had performed certain deeds, and thus sainthood was bestowed upon them. But rather the word saints is used in reference to people who were alive and who had been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, as Paul recounts in Romans chapter 1 in verse 7. And uh, so uh, individuals who have been set apart, that's what sanctify means, been set apart for holy purposes and holy uses, those are saints. These are individuals who have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And of course, there is the word disciples that is oftentimes used in Scripture. A disciple is a learner. He is a follower. And individuals who follow Jesus and who learn from His will are individuals who are disciples. These were called Christians for the first time in Antioch. But this name Christian is used today, but it was a word, a term, that was not given by the enemies of those who were disciples of Jesus, nor was it a term that was given by those who were followers of the Lord, but rather this term was one given by God Himself. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 62 and verse 2, we learn where the prophet Isaiah said, with reference to those who would be followers of God, that they would be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord should name. And so this term Christian describes those who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was a name, a term that was given by God. It's a significant term inasmuch as it describes those who are enslaved to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice where this word, at least it was used for the first time, and that is the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, and that's significant. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It stood behind Rome in power and prestige and notoriety, but there was another city, Alexandria in Egypt, there was also a very, very well-known city. But behind Roman Alexandria stood this city of Antioch as being one of the great cities within the Roman Empire. It was a city that was known, however, for its licentiousness and its vile conduct on the part of the population. Uh, they had a reputation in the ancient world. In fact, near the ancient city of Antioch in Syria were the groves of Daphne in which people indulged in every kind of orgy. And that as they worshiped the goddess Daphne and all the other gods uh, that were characteristic of that particular point in time. But amazingly, even there, right there in the midst of sin, paganism in which orgies were conducted, the gospel of Christ came, and many people were obedient to the faith. In fact, you get the idea in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1 that the city of Antioch, the church there, became the center of world evangelism. They sent out Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey 
as it has begun to be recorded in Acts chapter 13. And we find that Paul himself took three journeys uh, originally from Antioch. Evidently, the brethren sent him out on these missionary endeavors. And these are the folks that were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, the term Christian has become variously used today. We find, for example, uh, the term Christian is reserved for somebody who may be from America. You may go to another country in the world and uh, they look upon you as a Christian because you are from America, as they see that America is a Christian nation. And so that word Christian sometimes is used in, in that particular tense with re, or a sense with reference to nationality. But also we find that the word Christian is used commonly today with reference to one's character. And we refer to a person as being a Christian if they are good people and uh, they have certain qualities about them. And uh, we uh, describe them as being Christians. Well, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 2, we've already made reference to this passage, but here is Cornelius being described as a devout man, one that feared God always with his entire household. He prayed to God, and he gave much alms to the people. I don't think there's any question but that Cornelius was a good man. I imagine he made a good neighbor. I would imagine he made a good soldier in the Roman army. He was well liked and respected by people within his household, and he was liked and respected evidently by those who were his commanders in the Roman army. But he was not a Christian. He was a good person, but not a Christian. So an individual may be from America, but that doesn't automatically make them Christians in spite of the way in which some people use the term. And a person may be a good person, morally upright, honest in their dealings with their fellow man, pay their taxes as the government requires, and in every other way conducts himself in a very, very wonderful fashion, morally upright, and uh, treats his neighbor in the proper way. But that does not make them a Christian, does it? A Christian is one who in fact is in Christ. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul wrote, For as many of you as have put on Christ, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And uh, when one is baptized into Christ, that means that he's changed his relationship. He is out here in the world, but now then he's changed his relationship. And he now has a new relationship with Christ. In fact, he has a new relationship to sin. In Romans chapter 6, uh, Paul referred to the idea that uh, one who is a Christian uh, has been, uh, had his sins removed, he's been buried in the likeness of Christ's death, and he's been raised to walk in newness of life. A Christian then is one who is in Christ. He has a right relationship with Jesus. And one can be an American, but not a Christian. An individual can be a good person, but not a Christian. A Christian is one who has changed his relationship to Jesus Christ so that he is now in Christ. He is one who believes in Jesus and has turned from wrong and turned unto the Lord. I want you to notice here, as we read a moment ago from the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, and uh, we read in verse 21 where that a great number that believed turned unto the Lord. In the latter part of verse 23, Barnabas urged them that they would cleave unto the Lord. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. In Acts chapter 26 and in verse 28, 
There Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Well, what was he almost persuaded to be? Well, in verse 18 of Acts 26, one thing was their eyes would be opened and they would turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That really is a Christian, isn't it? He walks in the light of truth and his life is so changed that is described as being turning from Satan unto God himself. And then in the latter part of verse 20, that they should repent and turn to God, doing works worthy of repentance. That's what a Christian is. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, the apostle Peter said, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but rather let him glorify God in this name. And then he said in verse 13 of 1 Peter 4, those who have uh, become partakers of the sufferings of Christ, those who have been reproached for the name of Christ, are individuals who are Christians. One who has been redeemed from sin by his obedience to the Word of God is a Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 18 and 19, Peter said, knowing that you were redeemed uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, not with, not with gold or, or anything of that nature, but rather with precious blood, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish, even the blood of Christ. An individual has been redeemed from sin by his obedience to the word of God is a Christian. And you don't have to be an American to be a Christian. And uh, certainly being a Christian is more than just being a good moral person. Now a Christian ought to be that and should be that. If he's not that, he's violating God's will. But uh, being a Christian is more than just being a good person. A Christian is one who has been bought from the bondage and the control of sin to belong to God. We referred a moment ago in Romans chapter 6, how that an individual who is a Christian indeed has been buried with his Lord through baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. That's a Christian. One who has been buried, immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. That's a Christian. That's a child of God. Romans 6 and verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. And a Christian is one who doesn't have to pay the price and the penalty for sin because of what Jesus has done for him at the cross and has given him life eternal so that he is a new creation as Paul described it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. You see, the death of Jesus Christ was a vicarious death. That is, He died in my place, in your place. He suffered the penalty for sin where you and I should have suffered that penalty. He was ill-treated by man and was without mercy and without due consideration of law, uh, crucified on a cross and died a horrible death. But He did that in our stead, who His own self in his body bear our sins upon the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Paul said, Him who knew no sin, he made to be sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So then Jesus became what he was not. That is, he knew no sin, but he was made to be sin, that you and I might become what we're not, and that is through him become righteous. Oh, we don't live above sin. That's not what being righteous is. But being righteous is trying to live according to the will of God. And Jesus Christ has died in order that we might be made righteous. And that's what a Christian is. You see, he has been redeemed from sin by the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ and has thereby given us hope. 
Really, a Christian is a stone in a spiritual house. You see, that's what Peter, uh, how he described a Christian in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, that we're living stones in a spiritual house. A Christian, then, is a disciple of Jesus who has been obedient to the Word of God. Many years ago, in what became has become known in in uh, secular history as the Reformation movement in which efforts were made to reform Roman Catholicism, a former Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther, who was from the country of Germany, uh, of course led in this Reformation movement. And some people were concerned about uh, uh, what was going to happen to the movement itself. And so they wanted to call themselves Lutherans after Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, do not call yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. All the people would listen to that admonition. Another famous Reformation leader by the name of John Wesley said, would to God that all party names were forgotten. Indeed, would to God that all party names, all denominational ties would be forgotten and that we would be called Christians, Christians only. Not hyphenated Christians, but Christians only. Alexander the Great conquered the known world when he was only age 23. There was a soldier in his army who likewise had the name Alexander. It was said to Alexander the Great that this man was named after him. But he was a coward as a soldier. On one occasion, Alexander the Great asked this trembling coward, Is your name Alexander, and are you named after me? To which the soldier replied, Yes. Then Alexander said, Then either be a brave soldier or change your name. Really, that's what we ought to be, children of God, serving the Lord, living up to the name of Jesus Christ, whose followers we are. Do you want to be a Christian? Become a Christian just like these people did, who upon hearing the gospel of Christ were obedient in being baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. God bless you.